to introduce Richard today, um, who I'm very fortunate to have working as a postdoctoral researcher in my lab. Um, Richie's got a very impressive CV. He did his PhD working with Professor Don Hilbert at the ETH in Zurich, um, where he engineered a computationally designed retroviral delays using ultra high throughput microfluidics um, technology. He then did a postdoc in um, Suga's lab in Japan, um, and then a, he, he took a position as a Marie Curie fellow um, working in Deck Wolfson's lab in Bristol. And then he's very recently started working with me um, developing biocatalytic approaches to um, therapeutic oligonucleotide manufacture. Um, but today he's going to talk about the work that he did whilst he was working in Japan. And he's going to talk about the discovery of macrocyclic peptide inhibitors um, against a membrane transporter. Thanks, Sarah, for the kind introduction. Also, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my research um, here on this um, uh, channel. Um, so the project I'll be presenting uh, was, a, uh, was a project that I did during, was working on during my postdoc in the lab of Hiroaki Suga at the University of Tokyo. And it is about discovery of macrocyclic peptide. So not really enge protein engineering, but rather peptide engineering. Um, sorry, I'll just switch to laser pointer. Okay, first to start off. So uh, macrocyclic peptides are um, often natural products or abundant natural products that can be found in various organisms. Um, here I've listed, for instance, three examples. For instance, we have alpha amantin, which is a poison found in the death cap mushroom, which inhibits RNAs, uh, RNA polymerase II. There's, for instance, cyclosporin, which is clinically used as an immunosuppressant, or, for instance, vancomycin, which is um, a peptide antibiotic. And as the name already suggests, all of these peptides have in common that they are uh, macrocyclic or show macrocyclic structures. And that macrocyclization has the advantage that it reduces the conformational freedom of the peptide and basically pre-organizes it for binding. In addition, it also makes the peptide more resistant to degradation, for instance, by proteases. So uh, macrocyclic peptides are actually becoming increasingly recognized as a new uh, drug uh, class of drugs, which could have, uh, or which basically combine the properties of biologics and small molecules. For instance, biologics are very like antibodies, show high selectivities because due to the larger, for instance, due to the larger interaction surfaces between uh, the molecules, and uh, similar things can also be mimicked with macrocyclic peptides. On the other hand, small molecules have the advantage that they are, um, for instance, uh, uh, cell permeable and can be also orally available. And some macrocyclic peptides also share these properties. So these, uh, I think, taken together and also other considerations make macrocycles a very interesting uh, drug modality. So to identify macrocyclic peptide, one can, of course, um, just try to discover uh, natural, naturally occurring um, uh, peptides in nature, for instance, uh, through metagenomics or isolation of natural products. On the other hand, of course, one can also try to engineer, uh, or especially rationally, engineer macrocyclic peptides. For instance, one could chop off a domain from a protein, cyclize it up, and use that as a protein-protein uh, interaction inhibitor. On the other hand, there's also the field of de novo discovery, where, you, where one basically tries to find uh, peptides for uh, directly or generates new peptide directly for a desired target. And um, approaches to do so are, for instance, uh, can be done chemically, for instance, in one bead, one compound uh, approaches. There is, of course, for, of course, phage display. There is Cyclops, which uses uh, intine mediated. Um, peptide cyclizations, and there is uh, also mRNA display, which, which I will focus here, or specifically uh, what I've been working on is called the RAPID system, which stands for Random uh, Non-Standard Peptide Integrated Discovery, and was developed in, this, in the SUGA lab. Here you basically see a schematic summary of the RAPID system. So uh, it basically consists of an mRNA display workflow, 
in combination with uh, the so-called FIT system, which stands for flexible in vitro uh, translation, which allows genetic code reprogramming. So I'll walk you now quickly through. So basically starting from a DNA pool, which is, um, uh, contains a randomized uh, sequence, which will later basically form the macrocyclic portion of the peptide, is transcribed into RNA. And subsequently, uh, a pyromycin linker is, a is ligated onto the uh, RNA. Pyromycin is shown here. Uh, pyromycin is, um, is an inhibitor of protein translation. It mimics uh, tyrosyl tRNA and can be incorporated into the national peptide chain. But unlike a tRNA, instead of having an ester bond, it has an amide bond and can't therefore be hydrolyzed. And therefore, upon incorporation into the peptide, uh, we can generate um, a um, cov covalent link between the coding RNA and the uh, uh, synthesized peptide. And so this promising construct can then, then be supplemented to an, a reconstituted in vitro translation extract. And at this stage, also the genetic code can be reprogrammed. Um, this is can be or this is achieved using flexizymes. Flexizymes, uh, with, uh, with a structure for which the structure is, for instance, shown here, are um, ribozymes that were uh, developed by Suga. And these specifically acylate the three prime hydroxy group of uh, tRNA with basically any amino acid uh, that you can think of. It can be, for instance, uh, having uh, modified uh, amino groups as shown here with a chloracetyl group, which will become uh, important later in a moment, or one could use D amino acids or non-canonical side chain. So basically any residue can be transferred onto the uh, three prime end of a tRNA. In the case of the selection I'll show you later on, I used for reprogramming, I um, reprogrammed the initiation position of the uh, um, of the peptide using a D-tryptophan that has been chloroacetylated and I supplemented, or this can be then supplemented into the translation mixture. So upon translation, the first amino acid then is uh, our um, reprogrammed amino acid with a chloroacetyl group. And this chloroacetyl group can undergo an SN2 reaction with a downstream cysteine leading to macrocyclization uh, of the peptide via formation of a thioether bridge. Uh, pep, uh, the mRNA of these conjugates can then be reverse transcribed to uh, cDNA and using affinity panning, uh, um, using desired peptides can be selected against, for instance, a protein target of interest. Uh, cDNA can be recovered, amplified, and the cycle can be restarted um, over and over again until decent enrichment is observed. Uh, we can then also sequence the DNA pool. Typically, you would use um, uh, next generation sequencing to kind of get a good idea on a good sequence or a good coverage of the final pool to see what is happening. And the best hits can then be uh, synthesized chemically and then be tested. So in collaboration with the lab of uh, Robert Tampe at the University of Frankfurt, we set out to develop uh, microcyclic peptides that interfere with um, an ABC transporter. In this case, it is a TM, TMRAB, which is a close homolog of the human transporter for antigen processing, which is involved in generating um, uh, immune responses. And so here you can see the structure of uh, the TMRB uh, protein undergoing uh, uh, basically um, a translocation cycle, which is shown here. It basically um, switches from an inward facing uh, conformation to an outward facing and back to an inward facing con um, confirmation, thereby basically shuttling a substrate from the uh, cytosol to the um, extracellular um, matrix. And uh, ABC transporters are typically composed of two domains. You have down here the nucleotide binding domain, therefore also the name ATP binding cassette transporter. And uh, these are linked to a transmembrane domain, which then mediates the uh, shuttling of the cargo. 
And so ABC transporters are very abundant membrane proteins uh, that are involved in various important physiological processes as well as diseases. And for instance, uh, these include, for instance, cystic fibrosis, lipid, lipid trafficking disorders, very important also drug resistance development in bacteria as well as in cancer cells. So um, to start off the selection, we initially decided that uh, we will start off using um, TRMB that has been stabilized in detergent micelles, and we started to perform our selection. Here you can basically see uh, the result or the enrichment um, of uh, the selection over the rounds. In total, I initially performed six rounds. The first round is always uh, has a low stringency so that we don't lose too much diversity. And then the stringency is increased over subsequent rounds. In black is the desired peptides that specifically bind to the protein. In red, which you can't really see here because it's too low, are non-specific uh, non -specific binders, which we try to perch along um, the uh, selection process. And as you can see here, up, up, uh, within uh, six rounds, uh, we can reach uh, good recoveries. Um, and if we sequence the final pool, we can basically see that we started enriching uh, certain peptide sequences quite significantly. Uh, for instance, the peptide sequence here shown in black makes up at the end nearly 40% of the total pool. We then um, synthesized some of these peptides and tested the KD values, uh, which is shown here using an, uh, fluorescence anisotropy measurements. And we could generate uh, peptides with KD values in the single digit nanomolar range. However, unfortunately, uh, these peptides were, uh, were binders of the protein. However, they did not inhibit uh, the uh, translocation um, uh, cycle of the transporter. So we basically then went back to the drawing board and uh, we figured out we need to improve uh, our protein preparation. So uh, we started off using a transporter we constituted in a lipid nanodisc. And in addition, we included a mutation, uh, which is shown here, which is uh, glutamate 523 to uh, glutamine, which basically uh, uh, um, um, removes its ability to hydrolyze ATP. We again started the selection. Um, within uh, five rounds, we could um, get a good uh, recovery. Also, the uh, recovery, oh, and we could perch out undesired sequences quite efficiently. So here you can see, I've visualized some of those sequences results using a protein similarity network, which is shown here. So here you see the sequencing results of round two, the top 5,000 sequences. Each dot that you can see here uh, corresponds to a, a unique peptide sequence. And right now you can see in round two, there's basically no significant enrichment yet. However, if uh, we go one round further in uh, round three, you already start seeing that we basically start uh, forming clusters of related sequences. Uh, this cluster here is actually particularly curious because um, it is, um, still highly diverse. However, there is basically only a very small consensus motif, which is a histidine at position two, uh, cysteine and a leucine at position four and five, respectively. In addition, we start um, uh, the emergence of additional cluster starts. And if we proceed to round uh, four, we kind of uh, get a significant enrichment of additional um, clusters of peptides. And in round five, we can actually observe that uh, one of the newly emerged sequences overtook the one that uh, was actually the, one of the most abundant one in the previous rounds. So as you can see during selection, um, things can um, also change and sequences can overtake others. And here you can see the structures of uh, the four most abundant peptides um, with their respective um, dominance in the final pool. And so now we had to set, or we set out to characterize those peptides to figure out uh, how or whether they are inhibitors of uh, the TMRB um, ABC transporter. So, however, first of all, we needed to figure out um, if these peptides are binding. So, Eric in uh, Robert Tampe's lab 
uh, measured uh, um, fluorescence anisotropy of TMRB um, um, immobilized in liposomes. And we could, and he discovered that the uh, these uh, new peptides had KD values of around 20 to 50 nanomolar. And these peptides could also uh, be used to selectively um, and quantitatively basically pull down uh, TRMAB out of uh, um, from purified, but also they could selectively isolate TRMAB complexes from cell lysates. Um, uh, so the next question is then, of course, if these peptides have any in inhibitory activity, which is uh, which was the goal of this project. So first of all, I think one important question is since this uh, since TMRB is trans or translocating peptides, are those are the selected peptides actually prone to be transported? So using TMRB again reconstituted in liposomes. Um, uh, Eric basically tracked um, transport of um, uh, of the peptides um, ac across uh, into the liposomes. So, for instance, here you can see a model substrate which is transported into the liposomes, uh, whereas the cyclic peptides are not transported into the liposomes. So, uh, yeah. So that was the first thing, and then of course the next question is. Do those uh, cycl uh, cyclic peptides inhibit the transport of um, cargo um, into the liposomes? So here we have uh, the transport and absence of the cyclic peptides. So transport is happening. In presence of the cyclic peptides, the transport is arrested. Um, however, since uh, peptide transport is also correlated with ATP hydrolysis, but um, peptides not being transported could still mean that ATP could be hydrolyzed. So the next question was, is ATP hydrolyzed? So he, uh, Eric performed an ATP hydrolysis assay, and he could show that uh, the cyclic peptides reduced the ATP hydrolysis down to the level of autohydrolysis. And so what we can conclude from these, uh, from these experiments is uh, that um, the CPs basically completely shut down the activity of uh, the TMAB uh, transporter. And in addition, you having used liposomes, uh, it must basically mean that the CPs are binding on the cytosolic side or on the nucleotide binding domain side, as that they are also not transported into the, into the liposomes. So now the next question is, of course, what is the mode of how these peptides interfere with the TMRB transporter? And uh, one thing is, of course, um, do they bind, for instance, in the peptide binding site or in the ATP binding site? So uh, we looked at um, uh, pept uh, peptide binding and whether pep or cargo binding is influenced, influenced by the presence of the cyclic peptides. So here you can uh, see the fluorescence anisotropy signal of a bound uh, fluorescent cargo. And if an additional um, unlabeled, or uh, if additional cargo that is labeled with a different dye is added, the fluorescence anisotropy signal drops. However, in the presence of our cy cyclic peptides, um, cargo binding still remains. So this suggests it does not compete directly with substrate binding. Looking at ATP binding, so here you can see the binding of the uh, um, uh, ABC transporter in absence of the cyclic peptides. So it binds ATP. And in presence of the cyclic peptides, ATP is still bound as well. So this means that the uh, selected cyclic peptides are actually allosteric inhibitors. If they're allosteric inhibitors and we have such a dynamic protein complex, it would be interesting or it's important to know are they are those peptides uh, conformation specific binders as well. So now the special thing about this TMRIB uh, protein complex is that it's a, a thermophilic protein. And uh, in order to switch it between the inward and the outward facing state, you need to have a high temperature um, or you need to increase the temperature up to 45 degrees. 
as thus you can basically um, prepare inward and outward facing um, uh, uh, TRMAB um, conformers. And so measuring the KD values to these, um, we could show that CP6 and CP12 prefer to bind to the inward facing state and a little less so to the outward facing state, whereas CP13 and CP14 prefer to bind the outward facing compared to the inward facing conformer. Um, this again suggests that most likely both of these peptides must have different modes or these two um, uh, peptide classes have different modes of inhibition. And in order to further look into that, Eric performed a so-called ATP uh, occlusion assay. So in this assay, uh, the ATP transporter is basically switched uh, to the outward facing state through elevated, elevated temperatures. And the um, occluded ATP can then be quantified. So here you can see basically the TLC analysis of the radioactively labeled ATP. And starting with the transport and the resting state, no ATP is bound because it's also not switched to the outward facing state. Using Vanadate as a control, um, which is a known inhibitor, which locks the transporter in the outward, in the outward facing state, but post ATP hydrolysis, we can basically see that there is ATP and ADP bound uh, to the transporter. Now for CP6 and CP12, no ATP is bound, um, whereas CP13 and CP14 arrest a transporter at the ATP bound state, which suggests CP13 and CP14 bind to the, uh, or stabilize the outward facing configuration of the transporter. So if we now take all those things together, uh, we could basically uh, select peptides that allosterically inhibit uh, the uh, transportation cycle at different stages. So we, have, we were able to find two peptides that selectively inhibit the inward to outward uh, um, conformational change and thereby inhibit substrate transport. Whereas uh, CP13 or as peptide CP13 and peptide CP14 inhibit the outward to the inward facing conformational switch. And at this stage also inhibit ATP hydrolysis and therefore arrest the transporter in the outward facing state. And using these peptides basically as mechanistic probes, um, uh, this model that you actually see here could be for the first time underpinned for a transporter that um, has not been um, uh, um, uh, incapacitated through mutation and therefore further underpins this model of, um, um, uh, of transport. Yeah, and so I guess in conclusion, one can see that using uh, selection techniques, one can find diverse peptides um, that can show many different modes of inhibition. But the important thing at doing or performing selections is uh, the correct preparation of the target protein. And so with this, I'd like to, first of all, thank my uh, postdoc supervisor, uh, Hiro Suga from the University of Tokyo uh, for giving me the chance and the opportunity to work in his lab on this project. And I'd also like to thank Professor Robert Tampe Dr. Eric Stefan and uh, Dr. Susanne Hoffmann, as well as Dr. Nina Morgner and Dr. Khan Wuhu from the Goethe University uh, with whom I collaborated on this project. And in addition, I'd like to thank the Japanese Society for the promotion of science for uh, postdoctoral funding. And also thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks very much, Rich, for a fantastic lecture. I'm gonna pass over to Anya, if that's okay to coordinate the Q&A session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Richard, for your talk and uh, in and telling us more about microcyclic peptides. For us working in pharma, this is a very exciting field. Uh, so it was great to hear that you you were able to find binders for two different epitopes. I'm going to pass it over to uh, uh, Andrew, who is our expert in residence in mRNA display technology, and who is dying to ask you a question. Hi, great talk. Thank you.
Um, yeah, thanks so much. It's really cool work. Um, I had a question around the, uh, the FIT technology and um, the incorporation of unnatural amino acids. So um, I know that the uh, flex design technology is pretty flexible when it comes to incorporating unnatural amino acids. Did you ever consider maybe trying to synthesize some nucleotide or maybe adenosine containing side chains that might be tolerated by the system to kind of guide your macro cycle into that ATP binding motif? Because um, I, I know that you got around it by doing the, the lipid encapsulation and some other blocking to kind of uh, knock off other parts of the protein you didn't want to bind to, but was there are there unnatural amino acids that could target you into that ATP binding domain that might help kind of focus your library where you want it to be focused? Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so I, I haven't done that, um, but I think in principle, something like that would be possible, like also very large molecule or like sidechain modifications are accepted by the ribosome. So that would be uh, definitely possible. Um, I have to admit, so with this project, um, we had to, or the selection F, or we had to, we tried many different things in order to kind of get the selection conditions for the protein, protein right. In addition, um, I tried it um, that, or the translation mixture also contains a lot of ATP, um, which is required of, for the energy supply for protein synthesis. And I was always a bit, uh, you can try to remove it, but I was always a bit reluctant to do so in order not to lose too many of my peptides in the process of doing so. So I think potent, like uh, something like that might definitely work. Um, it might be just that you need to remove the ATP, I guess, from the translation system so that you have less competition. Yeah. Uh, what we were mostly interested though is um, I think in finding um, allosteric or more like also allosteric inhibitors or uh, trying to find uh, basically like uh, domains where peptides can bind. So we also tried, of course, to solve the structure of the bound peptide, but unfortunately that was uh, not possible. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but so there's also a variety of natural peptides known, uh, I think from viruses and so on, for instance, that are known to bind, for instance, in the substrate binding pocket and basically blocking things there. So I think there is a variety of different modes of how peptides can interact uh, with uh, these transporters. Cool. Yeah. Um, I guess I have one more quick question. Um, so I noticed that a lot of your hits contained cysteine um, in the, the variable region. Did you see any issues with like um, non-homogeneous uh, cyclization, like forming a small macro cycle and a big macro cycle? Um, or... So in principle, that, that could happen. So typically what we would assume if we have two cysteine residues that normally the smaller cycle forms because um, the, that is the first cysteine that is basically translated and the reaction is so fast, so it would, should happen immediately. So for characterizing them, I also synthetically prepared using like protect, using protecting groups, I prepared the small cycle and the large cycle. And it was uh, only the larger, the larger microcycle was, uh, was, like, was binding and was active. The smaller ones wasn't. So I initially thought um, looking, at, looking at the peptide sequences, just give me a second. Uh, that it, the smaller cycle it would be more logical because especially since the rest of the peptide was so diverse. So I was thinking that maybe it's really just a tiny, tiny epitope, but that wasn't the case. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder if it's like sterically challenged because it's so close to your N-terminal end with the cysteine reactive group. Maybe it's just more favorable to react with that one that's further away. Uh, so Sugalab has, the Sugalab has looked into that. And I think starting from position two and onwards, it would form the, it would cyclize only if it's directly adjacent, then it is, um, then it's not uh, doing, undergoing SN2 reaction. I see. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Do we, do we have time for one more question, Anthony? Uh, yeah, why not? Uh, so, so Richard, I have a question. Uh, so most of those peptides are just um, 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 cyclic peptides, but have you considered or have any 
luck with post-translational modification of those cyclic peptides with other enzymes to introduce staples or other modifications. So uh, people are definitely working on those things. So for instance, in Sugalab, they are using uh, a lot of those RIP enzymes uh, to incorporate uh, post-translation modifications like uh, uh, thiazoles and other things or performing um, enzymatic cyclizations. And then there's also a lot of, I think people using phage display are also, use, or, uh, also using uh, RIP enzymes. 